I'm going to move now to our sermon for this morning. And the text for this morning is 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. I'm going to read the text uh, in, our Bible, in my Bible, and then we'll begin our sermon. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the, for the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God, who tests our hearts. You know we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. And God is our witness. We were not looking for the praise of, from people, nor from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like young children among you, now, just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you because we loved you so much. We delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are our witness, and so is God, of how holy and righteous and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of the gospel who calls you into his kingdom and glory. This is uh, the fourth installment in the current series that we are working through called Imitators and Examples. And this is a, a wonderful uh, series. Paul has written this letter to the church in Thessalonica that is a model church. And as he's been traveling through G Greece, he runs into a new community that not only hears the gospel, not only sees the example of Paul's suffering, and the sincerity of their message of repentance and faith, they receive it quickly, in large numbers, I might add, and then begin to share that message in their community, such that all throughout Greece and even beyond, people hear about this church. So Paul is delighted. Last week, Pastor Neek talked about uh, how uh, that in order for this to take place, what was required was for there to be martyrs, for there to be witnesses, faithful witnesses, who would share the gospel of Jesus Christ no matter what the cost. This week, I am going to move a little further in the text. And I'm going to talk about the essentials of being an effective disciple maker. The essentials of being an effective disciple maker. Uh, and today, I'm going to talk about two roles that anyone who desires to reach disciples for Jesus Christ, to reach non-Christians for Jesus Christ, needs to fill. We need to be messengers and shepherds. That's what we'll talk about today. And then next week, we'll need to be role models and coaches. We'll talk about that next week. But there's very specific things, very specific characteristics that I want to bring forward. What kind of messengers? Well, a disciple maker is a bold and trustworthy messenger. We're going to talk about boldness and trustworthiness. And then secondly, a disciple maker is a loving and self-sacrificial sh shepherd. So those are the things that we're going to focus on this week, and we'll jump right into it. Now, a disciple maker is a bold and trustworthy messenger. You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. What is really cool about Paul's work is, 
when you follow the story in Acts chapter 17, the scripture says that many religious Greeks, um, several Jewish people, and some prominent women came to faith as they entered the synagogue there. They had tremendous success. He said, so, so he says to them, you know that we had uh, tremendous success, but we had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dare to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. Pastor Nick talked about the opposition in Philippi. Uh, Paul and Silas in prison. Uh, the earthquake, the release, the release from prison. I want to talk specifically about the opposition in Thessalonica. Um, when they went to Thessalonica, there were certain uh, Jews there who didn't receive the message. And so what they did is they went and stirred up a crowd, and they told the crowd a part lie. And the lie was this. It was that these men have gone throughout the world, and they're telling people that there is another king other than Caesar. Well, yeah, he, he is another king other than Caesar, but it's a heavenly kingdom uh, with, a, with a future realization on earth, not a current kingdom. And so, but all they heard was that there's another king other than Caesar that sent the people into an uproar because they recognized that the Romans might come and to their land and and, and destroy them. And so what, what ended up happening was uh, Paul and Silas were staying at a, a local citizen's named Jason's home. They went to his home looking for Paul, and Silas couldn't find them, took the Thessalonians to their courts, imprisoned them, and made them post bond. So these folks, the Thessalonians, had experienced strong opposition in receiving the gospel, yet still received it graciously and moved forward with it. They were martyrs, as Pastor Nick talked about, faithful witnesses who shared the true, uh, who stayed true to their message no matter what. Now the question I have, the thing I want to go a little deeper in is this. Why do we have to be bold? Why do we have to share the message in the face of difficulty? And I've outlined, I think, three important reasons for that. The first is, we have an exclusive message. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, in one of Apostle Peter's first sermons, he tells those who are gathered there that there is salvation in no other name than in Jesus Christ. And when you told that kind of message to, to Jewish people in their temple, and they were used to hearing only about Jehovah God and, and had rejected Jesus, in fact killed Jesus, this, that wasn't a very popular message. And it's not very popular in our current time. If there are those who, ha who worship other gods or no God in all, at all, you can expect that there will be serious opposition. Therefore, you need to have boldness and can't be afraid when that opposition comes forward and then be prepared with an answer for those who come before you. Second, we have a big mission. In Matthew 28, verses, uh, tw yes, 28, verse 19, um, Jesus tells his disciples before he ascends into heaven to take the gospel to all nations. All nations is a big deal. Not just America, where there's liberty and freedom of religion, but other places where they may have no religion or there may be a state-sponsored religion. And I'm telling you, you, not only do you need to have boldness when you go into places like that, you need to have shrewdness. You need to use the radio. You need to use internet. You need to sneak in Bibles. You got to have some very stealthy kinds of techniques, house churches in order to be able to bring, to, to um, agree with God and not man, right? To take the gospel to all nations, even though man has said it's illegal. You got to be bold to do that. And then the last thing is that we have an apathetic audience. And that is the kind of the state that we are in. Many of the sociologists, even Christian commentators, say that this is a period of being 
post-Christian, where folks in our country are saying that we have been there and done that. And so that makes the ground hard, the, the hearts of the people that we're trying to reach, it makes them harder. And that's why we need to, the churches, um, that's why we need to be so faithful and so patient and kind when we witness to our neighbors and, and persistent. Um, I have been uh, uh, serving at a public school in Madison for three years, uh, mentoring boys. And my partner uh, is a woman there that's a social worker. And I have been wanting to invite her to, to come to church, and, and I, I, I would from time to time. And, uh, and fr from time to time, her family would go, would attend services. And it took me three years before I could get that family here. And, and she brought her sister. And unfortunately, that, this was right before the pandemic, right? Uh, but I still stay in touch with, with them. Um, we've got to be more patient, um, more persistent in terms of our witnessing when the culture is a little harder in terms of our message. So that's why we need to be bold. So the first characteristic of a messenger is they need to be bold. And the second one is just as important. We need to be trustworthy. 1 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4 says this, For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We're not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. You know we never use flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anybody else. Even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like young children among you, trustworthy because of God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, when God calls you into his kingdom, enables you to hear his message, uh, grants you enough repentance and faith to come to Jesus, he has given you a trust. And it's kind of like when I married my wife. Uh, the, her father uh, entrusted me with his oldest daughter. And, and that's a very precious thing. You've only got one uh, uh, Deborah Vaughn. She's a unique case. Viddle, viddle now. One Deborah Viddle. And to entrust you is a very serious thing. Now her uncle, Robert, came up to me and, and threatened me. He said, hey, if you don't take care of this girl, I got something for you. And he had this look in his face like he was going to do something. We've been given a trust. And when, as you're a parent, and you drop your child at the school, You've entrusted the school to keep them safe, to help them grow in scholarship, and to not, to, to not undo your values, but that's another sermon. There's a trust. God has entrusted us with the gospel, and it's required in stewards that we be found faithful. And he has tested our hearts. I talked to a woman at our church here recently this week. And she was saying, Lloyd, Lloyd, he said, this is really tough. I've got no sports. I've got no hair salon. And I've got no nail technicians, right? And that, that second one really motivated me. No hair. I'm like, what am I going to do? You know, come on. Really, it's that sports one that's really been on me. And the point God is trying to say to us, perhaps, is will we serve him faithfully when our pleasures have been removed? Will we serve him? Will we serve others faithfully? Will we use this time to reconnect in relationships with people that we haven't connected? That brother who lives in Pennsylvania who you haven't been talking to, will you reach out to them? Maybe God is testing us that now that he's removed our pleasures, 
uh, will we press in towards him? And he's been our witness too. And here's how God witnesses. One of the ways that we have been, the elders at our church, one of the ways that the elders of our church have been impressed and seeing God move is that in this pandemic when so many churches are struggling financially to keep their doors open, our people remain faithful. One of the ways that um, I've been impressed is the testimonies I hear uh, from the saints of how we've been reaching out to each other and sharing and caring. Um, when, when God is our witness, he witnesses with things like love and peace and joy and perseverance and self-control. He witnesses with fruit. And what Paul was saying to them is that, you see the fruit of this ministry? You see the fruit of our lives? So God has done a thing. And because God has done this thing, we have different motivations. Our motivations are to please God. Uh, our motivations are to be true to his message, to understand it well, and to represent it clearly. Our motivations are to walk in holiness more and more, to not only preach the truth, but to live the truth out well. Our motivations are to be pure, and I, we want to be above board. This, this, I, was, I was talking to someone and need to explain this illustration. There was a time, uh, a saying, that to be above board in playing cards is to have your hands on the table. So our message is open and above board. We tell you that God is going to bless you uh, now, that his truth and his word will bless your life now and in eternity with opposition, with persecution. So we don't have a tricky message that, that says only blessing with no struggle. We say struggle and blessing and eternal life. We're not tricky. And we are humble. And our objective is to inspire people to come to faith by a godly, precious life and not through authority. We want to be humble. And we want to be gentle, that image of a mother with her children. And so as we walk around, especially non-Christians, we want to be patient, and we want to be persistent. We know this takes a long time. We're willing to make the investment. And so we, we, we live that way because we're trying to please God. And Paul contrasts this as, as, as to the point of where we're trying to please ourselves. If we were trying to please ourselves, we would, there would be error in our message. We would create a message so that it would benefit us. Right? We would be greedy for money. We would take advantage of opportunities. Right? We'd be slick. We'd be seeking fame and glory because that's what I, the flesh wants. That's what my, my person wants. And then we'd be exercising authority and giving orders because that's just the natural way things are done. The world is looking for disciple makers to be inspirational, not demoralizing. This kind of godly life of truth and honesty and humility inspires people. In a, a recent book uh, called Teams That Thrive, the authors posit that, that Christian leadership teams, that there are five qualities of excellence, and one of those qualities is um, to be able to rely on inspiration rather than control to lead. So they build uh, relationships that take time and they, they lead through inspiration and not control. And so uh, that's really the thing that makes the difference for Christians. We are bold and we are trustworthy because that inspires people to come to faith in Christ. So a disciple maker is a bold and trustworthy messenger. Secondly, a disciple maker is a loving and self-sacrificing shepherd. First Thessalonians 2, 8 and 9. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you 
not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We work night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel of God to you. We want to be loving and sacrificial. One of the metaphors of being a, a Christian is to be a part of the family of God. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's a real, that's a, a true, that's true. It's a reality for us. And when we live into that reality, we are more effective in our disciple making. Um, we need to share the gospel in its honest truth, right? With grace and truth, like a family. When I was growing up in my household, well, sometimes my dad wasn't all that graceful, but it was always true. It was always true what he had to say. In my mom's case, there was a, there was a gentleness to it. And maybe that's why God gives us, ideally, both men and women in the house to balance that out a little bit. There's an honest truth in the family, right? And then there's open lives. You know, from time to time, you'll see your brother walking around. You'll see more in underwear. You'll see things that you really don't want to see. You'll see, though, their sterling moments of, of generosity. And you'll see the tough moments of greed and self-centeredness. The open lives. You'll see, you'll see it all. And you see your parents uh, work in third shift in order to take care of you. And so that's how it is in the family of God. And when Paul is preaching this message, he says, listen, we worked at night so that we could preach to you for free during the day. You could come over. We wanted to share our lives with you. And so as we challenge ourselves to be disciple makers, we want to challenge ourselves to be more, to give more. My wife often talks about be, when she was a college student uh, 10 years ago. If you, that's, that's a joke for those of you who know Deborah and I. And uh, her mentor was a woman named Ollie Watch Davis. And Deborah joined a, uh, a group called the Illinois Black Chorus that uh, sung black gospel music, but, but also other secular music. And she joined it her, uh, her freshman year, but worked with Ollie for three years straight. And three hours a week with Ollie. But then in addition to that, two nights a week uh, at Ollie's home when she was a newer mom raising children. And so she would come over and eat and babysit kids and uh, do Bible studies and just do life with her for three years. In addition to that, they went to the same church where Ali Watts Davis was the choir director, so she was in her choir, right? And you can imagine, in fact, the wonderful wife I have is a result of that mentoring she got from Ali Watts Davis, who treated her like family. And if you ever get around them today, it's really like a big sister, little sister relationship. And some of us are blessed to have relationships like that. We need to have more like that in the family of God. Uh, loving and sacrificial relationships that bring us into the kingdom of God. And a disciple maker is loving and sacrificial even in the midst of a pandemic. We have uh, since the COVID-19 has become a real issue. To my knowledge, we've only had one person who had a positive test result in COVID-19. About three weeks ago, we found out about her positive test. And I have been talking to her uh, ever since by phone, checking on her, see how she's doing. Uh, last week, she started to Things, she started to feel better about week two. And here recently, you can rejoice with me, she had a test and she got a po uh, negative results. And so, um, and it was assumed that her husband also 
had this disease, and, but he was doing much better. Here's what she said. Here's, here's what her testimony about the saints at our church and how they shepherded her. She said, the body of Christ is the biggest comfort ever. People are using their unique gifts to serve others. And you can sense when they call you and talk to you how genuine they are. Uh, a couple of women were making cards specifically for her and making gifts specifically for her. And others were offering to bring in meals whenever they were needed. Some folks just called to pray and to talk to encourage her. And as she considered how people had ministered to her over those three or four weeks, she said, I was overwhelmed by the generosity, the love, and the sacrifice of the saints. And as I have been kind of ministering to people during this pandemic, um, there's two things that I found have brought people the most comfort, especially when we've been captured at home during these safer at home rules. And they're simple things, simple things that uh, I would commend you to. Call people and pray for people. Now, I know young fo younger folks, millennials, you say, ah, I hate, I hate the phone. And if that's true, I get it. Text people. Find out what their prayer request is, going, and then pray f for them by text. Um, but people are, have been lonely, and people have been craving to have communication, and particularly craving to have people pray for them. One day, I was uh, at home and calling and praying for folks. I had a list of folks to call and pray, pray for. And I was getting a little bit drained. And then I got a call from a guy named David Lingle. He uh, works for the Wisconsin Family Council. And uh, David and I had went to the Capitol and prayed with both Democratic and Republican legislators. And he was just calling me, and I was like, when he called, I was like, Man, what do you want? That, in my mind, I didn't say that. I said, what, what do you want? And he said, Lloyd, I want to know how you're doing. And I told him honestly. And he said, Lord, I need to pray for you. I need to be praying for the pastors. And he, he prayed for a couple of minutes. I thanked him. And it just encouraged me and gave me the strength to go forward. I'm saying to you, brothers and sisters in Christ, one of the best ways we can shepherd each other, really at any time, but especially during this pandemic, one of the best ways we can shepherd each other is to pray with each other. You know, Jesus was known as the good shepherd. Jesus was known as the faithful and true witness. That is why these attributes of, of boldness, these attributes of love and sacrifice, these attributes of trustworthiness are so important because they mimic our Savior. And as we live into them, we can bring people to Jesus Christ just as Jesus did and just as his apostles did. Let us pray. Jesus, we are um, privileged to be entrusted with the gospel and to be counted worthy um, to represent you. And uh, Lord, we, we don't take it uh, lightly because we know that there are people listening uh, even now who are trying to see if we are legitimate, uh, whether we are really the kind of people um, that you say we ought to be. So help us, Lord Jesus. Help us to live up to this high calling that we have and to draw others into the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.